Hello, my name is Ian Larkins of Radius Law and welcome to our commercial bulletin in association with LexisNexis. If two business parties agree a deal with each referring to the deal being on their standard terms, whose terms will be applicable? This is known as the battle of the forms and usually it is the last shot fired that wins, i.e. the party that supplied its standard terms immediately before the goods or services were provided. A recent court decision, however, held that the first shot fired won. In this case, the buyer and seller had agreed deals in 2015 and 2016, with both parties referring to their standard terms. But the buyer had overlooked that some years earlier in 2011, it had signed the seller's customer file, which referenced its standard terms and included a statement that no other terms would apply unless agreed in writing by both parties. Parent companies are generally protected from claims against their subsidiaries, but there are exceptions to this general rule. A recent Supreme Court decision in the case of Akabi v Royal Dutch Shell has lowered the threshold for when a parent company may be attacked and be liable for the negligence of its subsidiary. There is no longer the need to analyse the case by reference to a threefold test that had previously been required. Instead, the court should simply consider the extent that the parent has taken over, intervened in, controlled, supervised or advised the management of the operations of the subsidiary. Requirements to comply with the parent company policies may be enough to make the parent company liable. On the 15th of January, the Supreme Court ruled that insurers had been wrong to refuse to pay business interruption claims that arose from the COVID-19 pandemic. This means that thousands of policyholders should have their business interruption losses paid. Inevitably, there will be ongoing litigation as the Supreme Court's decision is only binding on eight insurers and will be dependent on each specific policy wording. Nevertheless, the judgment will be helpful to other cases. The Financial Conduct Authority that brought the claim against the insurers has provided detailed guidance on its website. At the 11th hour of the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, in December, the EU agreed for a four-month, extendable to six months, interim solution to continue to allow the free flow of personal data from the EU to the UK. The interim solution was accompanied by a declaration that the Commission would look into issuing a favourable adequacy decision to allow the long-term flow of personal data. Now, whether adequacy will be granted is still to be confirmed, and there are some doubts, primarily because of the UK's surveillance regime, which privacy campaigners have criticised. Even if an adequacy decision is granted, it is expected that there will be legal challenges similar to the successful challenges that have already been made concerning the EU-US personal data transfer, and that's for similar reasons. It is therefore recommended that businesses that are reliant on the free flow of personal data from the EU make contingency plans. The Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, has announced that it is resuming its investigation into the ad tech industry, which it had paused in May 2020 due to the global pandemic. The investigation focuses on concerns with real-time bidding, the process where web adverts are sold at the blink of an eye based on the user profile. The ICO has previously stated that it considers all real-time bidding practices to be non-compliant with the GDPR. The industry has since produced its own guidance. IAB UK published guidance on cookies and consent, special category data, and data protection impact assessments. And the Data Marketing Association, the DMA, and the Incorporated Society of British Advertisers, ISBA, published the seven-step ad tech guide, which was produced in consultation with the ICO. But this latest announcement from the ICO suggests that the industry action so far has not been sufficient. The UK Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, and the European Commission have released results of an annual screening of websites that found that 40% of 
agreeing claims made online could be misleading consumers. In over half of the cases, the trader did not provide sufficient information for consumers to judge the claim's accuracy. In 37% of cases, the claims included vague and general statements such as conscious, eco-friendly and sustainable. Now this is an early warning about the importance of ensuring that environmental claims are correct and supported by evidence. Failure to do so may lead to regulator activity and misrepresentation claims. The Supreme Court in a landmark decision has confirmed that Uber drivers are workers, not self-employed contractors. They are entitled to holiday pay and the national minimum wage. This decision will have profound consequences for other businesses that may be wrongly classifying workers as self-employed personnel. There are five key factors that were relevant to its conclusion of worker status in this case. One, Uber dictates the rate of pay by setting the fare calculated by the app. Two, Uber imposes the contractual terms on which the drivers perform their services. Three, Uber restricts drivers once they are logged into the app about whether or not to accept a request for a ride by imposing a penalty if too many requests are declined. Four, Uber exercises significant control over how the services are delivered, including the use of the rating system. And five, Uber restricts communications between drivers and passengers, preventing the drivers from establishing a relationship with customers beyond a single journey. The IR35 reforms, delayed from April 2020 due to the global pandemic, will be implemented on the 6th of April. The intention of IR35 is to ensure that appropriate income tax and national insurance contributions, NICs, are paid by contractors who provide their services through intermediary companies. The IR35 rules bite where, but for that intermediary company, the individual contractor would be deemed an employee of the client. Medium and large businesses must carry out status determinations to assess whether IR35 applies. If they do, the client is responsible for tax and NICs deductions. Due to the impact of the global pandemic, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has announced that large employers, that's employers with 250 or more employees, now have until the 5th of October to report their gender pay gap information for the 2020-2021 reporting year, which uses a snapshot date of the 31st of March 2020 and the 6th of April 2020. In the recent case of Phones for You Limited, the EE and others, Phones for You alleged that the mobile network operators, senior executives, had colluded unlawfully using their personal email accounts. The case then centred on whether the executives were required to disclose their personal email accounts. The court ruled that the mobile network operators must ask their executives to cooperate. If the executives do not cooperate, then Phones for You could apply for disclosure orders directly against those executives. With the vaccination program in full swing, we've included some Q and A's here in response to some of the regular questions that we are being asked. Can employers mandate their staff to be vaccinated? Now this is an untested area of law, but we believe mandatory vaccination policies for all staff are likely to lead to discrimination and unfair dismissal claims. It is worth noting that the government is not mandating NHS staff to be vaccinated so most employers will inevitably struggle to justify why it is different for them. Mandating vaccinations for specific job roles is more likely to be reasonable. For example, if staff travel to other countries for work and need vaccinations. Even if an employer does choose to mandate vaccinations, it will then need to require employees to disclose their vaccination status, which will be fraught with data protection challenges and will need a data protection impact assessment to be completed first. Can employers require new starters to be vaccinated? Now this is less risky than requiring existing staff as there is no risk of unfair dismissal claims, but there may still be discrimination claims. Can the return of employees be based on who has been vaccinated? Possibly, 
but it still has discrimination risks. It may be indirectly discriminatory against younger employees who have not yet been offered a vaccination and against employees with other protected characteristics, e.g. disability, belief or pregnancy. The Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service, ACAS, has issued guidance on getting vaccination for work. The Chartered Institute of Personnel and De Development, CIPD, has also produced a useful guide for employers. An estimated 2.4 million adults in the UK experienced domestic abuse in the year ending March 2019. This is compounded in 2020 with the impact of increased home working, self-isolation and lockdown. On the 14th of January, the government published its report on improving workplace support for victims of domestic abuse following its review last summer. The report sets out best practices for employers and proposed next steps. These include a recommendation that all organisations should, wherever possible, implement a domestic abuse policy and train champions to recognise the signs of abuse, as well as other workplace support measures. The ACAS Working From Home During the Coronavirus Pandemic Guidance, available on its website, includes a new section on domestic violence and abuse. That's it for this month and thank you for tuning in. We've included links to all of the documents we have referred to today in a written version of this bulletin. But please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of my colleagues here at Radius Law for more information.